All right, welcome back to Technique Matters, guys. So for this week, we are going to talk about uh, my deadlift. So we're going to continue on our kind of um, series of videos talking about, you know, analyzing our lifts and trying to put things into context for you guys. Hi, guys, I'm Clinton. So today, once again, we're going to talk about JJ's deadlift. So before that, we talk about um, my squats, Adam's bench, and this time around, it will be interesting because JJ's leverage for deadlifts aren't the best because he has pretty short arms and uh, short torso, fairly longer legs. So it's pretty hard for him to set himself up even for conventional. Uh, but today we're going to talk more about his sumo and his journey uh, of his sumo deadlift from about six months or so ago till now and all the things that we have learned and have adapted to. And today we're gonna discuss everything for you guys, okay? So I think without further ado, JJ can explain the start, which is the 200 kg daily visit. All right, so I think what we are looking at right now is 200 kg singles. Yeah. So as you can see, even though he put the weight up, there are some uh, things that we wanna put focus into. So as a, as as his coach, what I saw was definitely uh, when he start pulling, the weight starts to shift towards the heels, the hips goes up, and then there's a lot of posterior dominant movement. So there's a lot of back movement going on, a lot of hamstrings, but the whole idea of a sumo, we always encourage people to use their quads a bit more. So because of the positioning, whereby his hips are so high up, it is very hard for him to recruit the muscles, uh, the knee extensor muscles which is why he's being forced to use the back. So even though it's a weight that he's pretty happy about because he lifted the weight up, but there are still a lot of things to work on. So JJ, why don't you share with them, the, the audience, how do you feel about this lift? Um, yeah, so I think this kind of like 200, or like one, about 190, 190, 200 range for, in terms of a single for me, it was when I was, was, was around the time when I was coming back around like circuit breaker that time. So after our lockdown here in Singapore, I was pulling about 190. I think we started at 190 and then we started progressing up to 200. <clears throat> so I realized over that first block, uh, what was very kind of um, successful for me was that, you know, when it started to, because we had this kind of weekly increments and stuff, I could feel like I was really getting good at pulling that single and really improving my sort of top end strength because we are fresh out of a lockdown and stuff. But I think one of the things that um, started to happen was when I started touching around the 200 range, my, my technique just couldn't hold. So my positioning, my sort of setup and stuff got really, really messy as you can see from this 200. Um, yeah. So, so basically what was happening with my, with my, with anything sort of like within like maybe I'll say 197 to 200 range is that this issue of my setup, or me getting pulled out of position would be, which would be really, really uh, apparent. So I think what we thought at that time was that it's okay. Um, it's okay. We just let we just put the singles um, up for the time being. So we just keep, you know, um, kind of um, playing around at this range and trying to uh, improve, you know, ever so slightly the single. Cause it wasn't a time to really push singles. Uh, singles in the training was more just to let us touch that heavy intensity, whereas we were focusing on doing like um, improving our kind of um, back down strength or our baseline strength. So we would do sort of like 175 for three, four, four fives kind of thing. Yeah, so it was more of a accumulation phase with a heavy single um, to, to, to start the kind of session on the day. Um, but um, I realized that it was, it, it kind of was very challenging on me men mentally because uh, every single time I would execute or I would improve the back down work, I would continue to improve my back down work, but my singles just <clears throat> weren't getting a lot better. And it wasn't because I wasn't getting stronger. It was because um, my top end, at the top end, my technique couldn't hold. In general, after looking at the lift itself, so as JJ's coach, we feel that um, the most, after that phase whereby JJ is hitting all the singles and Eventually, he started to feel a bit more gassed out because he just feel that something is not right. 
uh, we started to take a different approach by looking into what are the technical failures uh, which can be improved uh, based on the heaviest single he had uh, done, which is the 200 kg. So from there, we realized that, okay, he needs to get himself into a more ideal position. And one of the most superficial reasons and as a coach lah, is when you see someone pulling and the weight starts to shift to the heels, we can clearly or usually we'll just say that, okay, maybe there's not enough tension uh, on the the lower body especially and hence we want to set ourselves in a better position and because of that i i felt that maybe it's because jj has not grabs the element and the skill of pulling the slack properly which is why uh the next few sessions we put a lot of emphasis on pulling the slack okay so why not uh, jj can you share with us uh how did you feel and what what you were experiencing when we are focusing more on pulling the slack, getting the aggressive hard pull before we wedge our hips in. Okay, so I think one of the things when we, we were kind of thinking about the slack pull was, um, I think this is something that I realized later on through the training rather than necessarily as a result of, um, as a result of just like, you know, my coach telling me a cue and I'm, and I'm trying to just like implement it, right? Was that um, when I pull the slack, uh, I'm trying to really kind of like use the whole bar or try to use all of the tension or the, use the bar as a kind of like a counterbalance, right? And I'm also trying to really drive a lot of um, extension um, in terms of like, you know, kind of lifting the chest up, the head up, um, everything. So you can see that as I go to pull, what tends to happen is I try to, I try to look up and, and then I try to kind of like drive this kind of head up position as well as like an upper back kind of extension position, right? So inherently speaking, what this is going to, you know, subconsciously do for me is to drive a more upright torso position, which is the thing that everybody likes to chase in a sumo deadlift. Everyone wants to get as upright as possible, which I think for me um, was not the most ideal thing possible because um, what happens is when you get very stiff in the upper back and stuff, what you tend to do is you want to kind of, instead of, um, setting your your hips in the right position. What you tend to do is you want to kind of like, like kind of think of yourself as a deadlift jack, and you want to kind of like jack the weight up um, like this. Which you see a lot of high level or more advanced sumo deadlifters or better leverage sumo deadlifters being able to do because their arms are long, which is not the case for me. So, um, in so what happens was that when I start to pull the slack very hard, right, and create this kind of lever motion my hips will actually drop um, and my weight will kind of uh, shift towards uh, my my hips will actually drop and then i'll get very heel heavy so in, essentially what's trying to happen is i will feel like i'm trying to squat the weight up in terms of like driving through the foot and what happens is i don't have tension in my i don't have tension really in my quads or my legs at all um, and i'm just trying to really uh, just kind of set the position and then pray that I can just, you know, hold the position and, and just push with whatever force I can into the ground. So this was my best um, set kind of um, before we realized that, you know, some, some of the things uh, we really needed to really needed to look at the program to change. So uh, looking at this set, what do you, what do you think? Cause this was kind of like in September, uh, it was, I, I was quite happy with it to be honest um, in terms of just because it's the most I've ever done was kind of a red PR but uh, yeah what, what are your opinions looking at this well uh, at first look honestly before before you provide the feedback I feel that the positioning itself looked pretty ideal especially towards the first few reps uh, it's not as crazy the, the hip shifting is not as crazy as uh, what we saw on the previous clip, which is a 200 kg. So what we see here, it's a very nice consistent movement where the bar travels upwards. Okay. Uh, but sometimes what is what we see, why not be how you reflected it? So as mentioned just now, uh, when you mentioned that, uh, you feel more like a jack. So instead of a movement up and down where you are driving against the floor and feeling the weight going up, you're feel you're you're doing it as if you're hinging and wedging and over wedging until you feel like the weight is coming off. All right. So I think this 
as you say, it works for better leverages people because obviously when their arms are longer, when they wedge their hips in, naturally the weight will just pop off the floor. But because of their ideal torso angle, but because for someone like you with JJ, the short, the shorter arms cannot allow that upright torso. And then plus you are forcing uh, an even more extended position, which will make you even weaker, uh, especially in that, uh, if you look into that context. So uh, after knowing that feedback, we realized, okay, something is not right again. And possibly what's happening is uh, we are still pulling at a pretty heavier weight. And which is why we decided to change the approach of the program, even though uh, you are progressing quite well at 185. Because uh, I have learned that at that point of time, you told me that some, you just don't feel right. Okay, it's not sustainable. This technique is not sustainable. You feel that you are putting so much effort into pulling the slack, trying to make, uh, make the lift, but you feel that when it goes heavier, it's not going to hold. It makes sense because you are only about 66 kg. How, how much are you going to like, lever the weight up like a deadlift jack? There's no way. Even someone with a very big and uh, big, like huge body weight cannot do that. They still need to have an element of getting themselves in a more ideal position. Okay. So uh, I want to add as well, during when, when I was watching that video, I still feel that uh, because you pull the slack so hard, right? It is. It, you don't have the ability and the uh, range of motion to actually wedge yourself in a more ideal position. Everything seems to be so tensed up that when you attempt to set your hips in the right position, you just follow through with everything staying super tight. Okay, so the idea of wedging, uh, pulling the slack and wedging in is to pull the slack so that you can create tension on the upper body as well as a bit on the lower body. But when you start wedging in, there are still room for you to change the angle of the knees, set yourself knees, uh, knees out a bit more so that your hips will get into a more ideal position uh, which result in a better torso angle. But uh, for someone like JJ with this kind of leverages and also your, your hip uh, development is not as wide as the, the usual people, it's very hard for you to create this kind of reenactment as I've explained. So uh, obviously from there we know that okay, fuck this this is not the right way. Uh, we need to try and approach it in another way. But this is a very big question mark. We don't know how to fix it yet. Okay. So you guys will be surprised what's coming next because uh, because the fact that we are doing such a high intensity, JJ is feeling very stressed uh, and he doesn't feel any more confident about the lift. And obviously the momentum dropped. So we decided to plan ourselves as, okay, let's try and bring the weight down and just practice the five repetitions. Right, which is what's coming next. Uh, yeah, so, so, so just to add to that, I think the other thing that I was also doing was not, um, was also in, because of the way that I'm trying to lever the weight up. Um, this is one of the things that I think a lot of, you know, I think maybe about 10, 10 years ago, it was a little bit, or like five to 10 years ago, it's a little bit more kind of popular thing to talk about. It's kind of like pulling back, right? Instead of pulling up, so because you are thinking of levering, right, you get this diagonal force that is going backwards. So you're thinking about like kind of um, pulling kind of like in a, in a reverse kind of J kind of path of the deadlift, which is, which is wrong because um, you want the bar to go straight up. You don't want the bar to go back, right? If, you, if you're thinking of going back or leaning back, right, that is, that is when you are trying to kind of just use your body weight or use the, uh, your ability to kind of chest up or extend to pull your weight Kind of under the bar which is not ideal because what happens when you start to do that is you disengage your legs entirely right you don't um, if you think about a leg press right if you load 700 if you load 700 kind of like kilos on the leg press right you're only going to move you're going to bend your hips so so little before the weight the weight just comes crashing down on you so in a deadlift when you try to um, kind of create this low or a deep hip flex angle. So if you kind of think of like you, the, like say this is your torso and this is your femur, right? If your hips are like this, right? You're going to have to create a larger force to kind of overcome the weight that's on the floor. So what they'll cause you to do is you want to kind of um, like lean back to open up that kind of angle. But then because you, because you, you lean back, right? You've thrown out your shoulder position, which will then, as you go to pull, 
your shoulders will come forward like this and then you will still create that same kind of hip angle as well. So that makes it super, super inefficient. Um, it makes it hard for you to even brace because you will have braced in a position that is not the same angle as which your, your torso started in. Yeah, so I think what we realized from this is that the top single was actually not just in terms of programming for the deadlift. The top single was kind of killing my momentum across like the rest of my training as well. So my squats would be would feel very um, would feel very hard in comparison because I was still getting taxed by the deadlift. So um, that that kind of suffered as well. It didn't uh, give me any kind of room to recover from my squats. And so what we did was actually we didn't go to five first. We went to triples first. So we started pulling around um, this. I think we started around one. I think we after that session we deloaded to about one seven something, and then we sort of kind of built up from I think one seven five and then one eighty. 185 and then 190 so which is this 190 triple so this was week two of that block that we were doing triples um, so as you can see what happened was that because the relative intensity is a lot lower in terms of it's not 200 right it, it, it's just yeah it's, it's not a top single um, I could still actually get some kind of volume work in and and continue to kind of um to continue to kind of uh work so this is goes back to what we were talking about when we when i initially came back from the lockdown and stuff what we started to realize is that this range is that the 190 range is actually allowing me to do some amount of good work right uh we still can accumulate a little bit of volume we still can progress a little bit but the next video that i will show you is the 195 the week after and this is when we realize that it is the same problem that is arising again, which is I will just put a little bit more weight on the bar and like things will, will start to get very, very messy. So um, bear in mind that these were just like a week apart, right? So a five kilo jump on a top triple is not, it's not, I wouldn't say it's a big percentage jump. Um, so yeah, so if you, if you all start to realize again, So I actually missed the third rep here because I think I, um, and, and, and here you can see actually in this video, you can actually see the big problem with the slack pool and the problem that we will be talking about um, next, but let's just ad address like what we are seeing here um, and see what Clinton has to say about, you know, one, one night, 190 and 195. So, yeah. Yeah. So for, for 190 itself, it's still not that bad. Uh, hips are maintaining its position somehow uh, and then the weights are coming up so I guess the, lever the, the levering method still works at this weight but when it goes up to 195 because the poundage is a little bit higher you have more or less hit the certain threshold of how much you can lever the weight up things started to go to self and back to how it was when it was 200 kg okay so the hips will go super high the, the weight will start to shift back to the heels and even worse is your back will flex even more uh, probably because of all the extension work we have tried to do your back has get really really fatigued already so you started to flex it back into that position and then you'll pull again so uh, in a way we have gotten ourselves back to square one uh, because obviously the cue and approach that we are going towards was uh, not the right the right way so that uh, I always feel that a problem has like in order to fix a problem there can be many many solutions so the solution that we have tried to pick on uh, doesn't work which is why it resulted in a little bit of setback uh, supposedly to do three and then can only manage to do two but uh, in a sense that because of this journey we get to understand that okay this is not the right cue for JJ because uh, because of that uh, the cue just simply doesn't work so we need to figure out another way. And then that's, that's probably where we say, okay, uh, we need to bring the weight down. The momentum is shit now because we obviously feel a lift, right? So the momentum is shit, so we need to bring the weight down. And started, we started doing fives. That was the time we started doing fives. And then uh, what I said to him, what I said to JJ was, okay, the slack pulling doesn't work. So 
just go with the lighter weights and start to just pull and then learn eventually as you go along each repetition, try to get enlightened on what are the things that you think can help in getting yourself in a more ideal position. So if you so just to kind of like reiterate some of the things that are being said here, um one of the, the first thing is the back flexing, the hips high, as well as the, the weight on the heels. So if you look at my kind of if you look at my feet on the second rep, you can see um you can see that the the front of the foot is actually kind of like lifting up like that, right? So that just show goes to show that okay, um there's a lot of kind of shifting backwards, a lot of levering, a lot of pulling, right? which is not a good strategy if you are trying to deadlift uh, a lot, especially in the sumo because you're trying to use your quads, right? But if you are on your, if you're on your heels, it's very rare that you will ever be able to, your, your quads will be in the right position to leverage well and to be able to kind of um, do that. All right. So um, one of the things that we started to do was that, okay, we realized that, you know, um, because we, we cannot just keep flatlining ourselves in terms of like with the intensity. So we decided that instead of trying to use this intensity approach, which for the rest of my program worked very well because um, my squats respond in terms, because my, I'm a little bit more built to squat um, and my range of motion on bench press is very short. So we can, we can use intensity to drive the other two lifts. But our initial assumptions about the deadlift is wrong because my deadlift is, in terms of leverage as well as in terms of um, relative strength, I would say that it's probably a lot more of a like early intermediate kind of range. So we decided to focus on, rather than trying to treat my deadlift like, uh, like a more advanced or uh, senior lifter, I would say that we started to treat it more like a novice lifter. So we started to peel back and kind of think about you know, what would you do if you had, had a novice deadlifter come to you? And we, we think that, okay, like, you know, in a traditional sense, you would kind of do like an accumu a technique phase, then accumulation phase, and then a little bit more of intensity phase when it's nearing competition, right? So we decided that we will stay further away from the intensity, do a little bit more of accumulation in a more traditional sense. So, you know, moving reps, uh, in, uh, adding sets, or, you know, keep, keeping the top end intensity very high which was what happened, um, I think, in the, in the last month or so. So, um, and I think one of the biggest things that helped me to, because I was thinking so much about the slack pool and stuff, one of the biggest things that at, at some point I think um, I was, uh, I think this is one of the cues that I learned from, like, you know, I try to pick up along the whole process, I try to pick up a lot of cues from people you know, I, I ask other people about like, oh, what are some feedback you can give me looking at my lift and stuff. Um, some people say, oh, you know, I think you are on too much of your heels, uh, which is something that we know. So let's try to give, you, give yourself a little bit more space to kind of go onto your midfoot or even your forefoot a little bit because even if you're on your forefoot, your tendency will be to eventually shift back anyway. So if you can get a little bit more on your forefoot and stuff, that will allow you to actually drive with your quads a little bit better, right? Which is something I try to play around with. But I think for me, the kind of um, biggest discovery was that the slack pull, I was trying to be a little bit too um, aggressive with it. Um, and which what happened was that lead to me kind of trying to be too upright, number one, but also it kind of pulled me out of position all the time. And what position I'm talking about is actually the brace, right? When I try to get too upright, um, yes, I can kind of hold that position when the weights are light. But then um, I think one of the cues that I got from like one of my, one of my, one of the other coaches was that, do you ever think about how much you can pen lay roll? And when you try to pull the slack so hard, it's like you're trying to pen lay roll like 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 eighty percent of your max, which doesn't really make sense, you know. Like unless you have an insane pen lay roll, then may maybe you can pull that way. You can pull very aggressive. You're trying to to pull the bar and make it float, right? Um, but no no matter what, because of how I was built, that is not a possibility. So the video that I'm showing here is actually I try not to pull the slack um, too hard. So what you will see. And what we're looking at in this case is the bar doesn't really bend as much off the floor, right? 
Um, and it starts to kind of only like bend again when I start to go up, right? So this is the the last rep is kind of the example. Yeah, so I pull really, I pull um really hard, right? Like I try to go back to my old habits. I pull really hard, and then I realize okay, I'm overdoing the slack pull, and it's causing my back to round. So what I do is actually I, I kind of felt that position that was off, so I reset pull the slack a little bit more gently, just pulling enough so that I hear the bar click and it allows the rest of my lower body to maneuver into position. And what that allows me to do is also, um, I don't need to lift my head up as much to drive the extension. And I'm also not very upright. So you can see that my torso lean is a lot um, more over the bar. But what that allows me to do is actually use my quads to drive the weight off the floor. And you can see that my knees also kind of, it still shoots back a little bit, but then it, it's, it's a little bit more on my midfoot or even my forefoot. Yeah, so um, this was, I think, the week one day uh, four. So it's my secondary deadlift day. And this was this week's deadlift, which was to match my best five. Um, and... Yeah, so what, what, do you, what do you think uh, about, about this, about my fives? Okay, so, uh, so after JJ realized that he's pulling too much slack and he started pulling this way, what I noticed uh, firsthand for sure is that, wow, he has more, it feels like it's easier for JJ to get into the position, which if you want to compare the previous time when he pulled the slack really hard, he, I can clearly see that it's very, very hard for him to wedge himself in. It feels like he tends up his body, literally his whole body too much that he cannot wedge himself into a better position. So yeah, this is one example. And because of the extender back as well, it's so hard to control. There's so many things to think about. Pull slack, whole body tension, back tight, and then trying to wedge himself in. Okay. Whereas on the latest, uh, later part of the videos, uh, yes, so which is this one, you can clearly see that it's so much easier for him to bring himself into position. That is because he, uh, he's no longer thinking about trying to pull the bar off the floor when he's wedging. Uh, before he wedge in, he's just literally trying to prime his upper body a little bit tighter so that he can have more range and more freedom around his lower body to wedge into a better position. Whereby... Uh, from this position itself because the that's I think that's the best JJ can do. You cannot be any more upright because of his leverages. So one of the better feedbacks you can ask uh, is can you free your quad more quad drive? If yes, okay. Can you then you look at the video? Is it is is the weight going to the heels? No, that means yes, the feedback was right. He's feeling a little more, uh, he's feeling his quads driving up. The speed of the bar is definitely faster. Uh, and if you feel much better than before when you're doing the same weight at 180, that means it's a win. So, um, so yeah, as much as I always try to encourage people to drive, uh, pull the slack hard, uh, that definitely doesn't work for JJ. And because of that drop in the, the intensity where we go back and continue to uh, work our deadlifts like a novice lifter, he get to realize that, oh, there are other ways that can make yourself feel better. So, um, so yeah, that's my feedback. What do you think? Oh, yeah, then this, this is the one, 170 kg where you, where you try to adopt another cue, right? To help you adopt, feel more quad drive. So, JJ, you can share with us. Yeah, so, so I think one of the things that, yeah, I agree with what, I agree with what you said about in terms of like trying to find something that works through you know, creating the program and stuff. But at the end of the day, you need to realize that the program is a, is a, should be a fluid, uh, responsive thing. It shouldn't be a dead thing. It shouldn't be something that you write and you go, okay, like I have to do this, I have to do this. Um, because it doesn't respond. It doesn't know what is happening in real life. It's just a spreadsheet, right? And you should feel like you are in a space where you can, you know, change it and adjust it and, do things that will help you to kind of um that are not easily sort of communicated from just a spreadsheet alone. So I think these are kind of things that you have to, you know, as coaches, we try to take into consideration as well. That's why we encourage you to talk to your coach, you know, um kind of 
you know, communicate some of the things that you're feeling, communicate some of the things that you are kind of experiencing in your own training because sometimes just based on video alone, it's, it's also very hard to see. You might be looking like you're, you're doing something correct, but you know, when we actually ask for feedback and stuff, you, you don't really have um, any of these things to kind of go by. So yeah, in terms of, um, so, so now that we know that, okay, the slack pool is something that um, I shouldn't, I shouldn't need to overdo because it, it will just kind of stiffen my whole body up and doesn't allow me to maneuver into a good position. The next thing that uh, I think uh, I was just kind of like training and building and then Adam gave me this cue, which was um, to kind of think about pinning the knees forward, right? Um, and what that actually caused me to understand was a lot of the cues that a lot of people, other people gave me. So try to be a little bit more on your forefoot. Um, try not to try not to be too um, aggressive with a slack pull. Don't try to penle roll yourself. To penle roll the, the sumo deadlift and you know, you want to just kind of think about uh, another cue was also, you just want to think about, you know, kind of using your, you want to think about going up. So Clinton gave me this cue was that you want to pull slack, right? It, it needs to go up rather than go back, right? And I thought that was pretty good because what that cue allowed me to do was to kind of coordinate my upper body with my lower body. And when Adam kind of told me the cue, you want to pin your knees forward, right? Throughout the lift. Um, what re the result of that was actually I, you can see that my shoulders um, don't come forward as much anymore and my knees is really kind of driving forward um, and that allows me to bring a lot more quads into the equation and the last thing that I think, you know, maybe it's better to compare the 180 against um, each other but you can also see that um, the angle in which my elbows form with my quads is a lot smaller so it actually in not pulling the slack right in not pulling the slack that hard i actually gave myself the ability to get in a more ideal position so what i'm talking about is this angle here so you can see a little if you can see that triangle here this is the kind of like angle that i'm forming on you know this 180 that was um pretty you know that was a max like a five red max was that I'm forming this triangle and this very big triangle over here as opposed to my latest 180 where I don't even try to pull the slack and my arms are already a lot closer to my quads in that sense. So when I go to pull, my hips is naturally in a closer position. So the angle is a lot smaller. I know the angle, the camera angle is slightly different, but you just see that the distance between my forearm and the quad and the knee is a lot smaller already. And then obviously the cue that Adam gave me, which was the 170, the knees forward cue, kind of reduce the angle even more. Look at how close my kind of forearm is to my quads now. Yeah, so I think the moral of the story is quite clear. Um, once again, I want to mention that uh, in order to fix a problem, there can be many solutions. So it's the journey that, that plays a part in helping you to find that enlightenment so by doing by dropping the weights and changing the program that's one number two is you also need to provide uh, you need to be clear like you yourself as an athlete needs to be clear what you are doing and what you are feeling so that you can use all this information share it with your coach and then we can all devise a better plan and give provide better suggestions for you because obviously if you if the coach doesn't have all these contacts it's very hard to just see it from the video itself so, um, in a way, because me and JJ, we, we train together all the time, we have pretty good uh, relationship and we always communicate. It helps in elevating and making it, the process a little bit faster. So, the heaviest we have done for, with this technique is 180, right? Yeah, so we'll start to slowly, not, not aggressively push the weights, but slowly move the weights up again and again until we reach the point where it's about 190. And we'll see how the technique goes again. But for now, I can confidently say that, yes, this technique is holding pretty much. I don't see that much of a technique flaw. As of now, I feel that this is the best JJ has ever deadlifted. So what do you think, JJ? Do you think we can go further from there? Yeah, I think for, for me personally, what I would want to do is to you know, try to continue to build up um, the momentum. I feel like the momentum is so... It's really, really so important. Um, and 
I, I need to personally as a lifter kind of decondition myself to 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 what uh, I think I need to do, which is, you know, pull heavy in training and stuff like that. Because I think from, you know, past examples, the best times that my deadlift has always felt is, you know, kind of holding off the the intensity and just really focus on using training to do a lot of um, good reps and a lot of good work and a lot of um, uh, time to practice, uh, like, the things that I need to practice. And I think it's, it's uh, one of the things that it can be a little bit tough for some people to deal with because you will see the rest of your lifts kind of like doing these incredible things. And then you have one lift that is, that is kind, of, um, kind of behind and you feel like you need to do certain things to it. And, you know, the, the process is important in terms of you need to understand you need to understand that yes, you can get cues from everywhere. Like the knowledge is free. There's so much knowledge being put out there from us, from other people, you know, from from everywhere. But it's not about the knowledge. It's more about the application, and it's more about having, you know, a good eye, a second opinion. Many people, you know, kind of trying to, you know, fine tune um, things, and, and don't be afraid to just. I would say also, don't be afraid to get opinion from other people. Because sometimes you know that that can that can when we're both like like Clinton said, the both of us train together, we have a good relationship. But sometimes it also causes us to kind of look at the same problem in a very similar way. Mm. And when it becomes that, then then we have like blinders on, right? But then like little things like you know when Adam trains with us, he'll he'll see a, something different. When other coaches look at my lift, they will kind of like you know message me and say you know maybe try this, try that, and stuff. And you know I I'm not trying to say, you know, go and let other people undermine you or help you to, or cause you to overthink. I think what you need to do is to think about, um, to think about, you know, how can I take all of this information and feedback to the people's whose opinion that I really, really, um, you know, that really care, that I really care about. And it's, it's not just like, okay, this person said this, then I try. It's more about like, okay, like, can we kind of help us to, paint a better picture of the situation okay so on that note um yeah i hope i hope uh, me talking about one of my you know like relatively weaker lifts is actually something that you know you guys can take away from this whole um series and we can we can you know that is actually helpful for you guys because there's no point of me you know uh, you know no point for us to make these kind of things if you guys don't actually see the value in it so i hope that um you've learned something um, I hope that you've taken away that context is really, really important. And um, if you like this kind of stuff, please like, share, and subscribe. If you've got any other questions, we are, the DMs are always open. The comment section is also open. And yeah, we'll catch you next time for you know a different series talking about uh, more good stuff about lifting. Bye. Bye.